subsequently it went to 4.5. Um, these patients, there's, there's a shift going on right now. Um, we look at things, again, from a production point of view. How much 3 do we produce? How much 4.5 do we produce? How much other do we produce? Um, right now, it, it's about 3 to 1, 3 to 2 of the 4.5, so most people are using, uh, well, it's moving to the point where most people are using 4.5, and that is what we recommend until we hear, you know, something else, something different. Um, I don't know how much difference there is between the 3.5, or the 3 and the 4.5, because of the type of drug it is and what it does to the receptor sites. No questions, huh? Right. Okay, taking other medications, 68% of the folks are taking other medications. This is not 68% are taking Avidex, Penicillin. They're taking something else. They're taking um, you know, Xanaflex or Baclofen, um, Soma. Soma has become a, a new big one um, that folks are taking. So the vast majority of these pa patients are taking something else uh, along with their um, LDN. Okay, other medications used. Okay, I'll refer you to the good doctor who was uh, on, what were you on, morphine and all sorts of other stuff and it didn't work. Yeah. The question was concerning opiates and LDN as a concomitant use. Okay, the speaker is now on. There are two major answers. There's the person who takes LDN and finds because of some uh, difficulty they run into that the doctor is prescribing narcotic-containing pain medication. That's a whole different issue than the person who has cancer and is on daily, long-term uh, narcotic-containing pain medication. That second group is dependent on the narcotic now. If they take one LDN, they go into an instant severe withdrawal reaction. They must not take LDN uh, at the first. The second group is not a problem because uh, they're not dependent. And so it's just a matter of being blocked. Uh, the LDN will block the narcotic. So in the second group, one has to go through uh, some great difficulty, but it's doable. Uh, Dr. Bihari claims over 90, possibly 95% success with his method, which involved, do you mind if I take your time? Go ahead, go ahead. Which involved immediately getting on large doses of non-narcotic pain medication. A uh, good example would be Norantin, which, which has a, a wonderful uh, a spread in terms of how high one can go on Neurontin without problems. Um, and there are a host of other drugs that one can take that are non-narcotic for pain, including Tylenol. Uh, some people took tricyclics in small amounts at night. But it would be up to the doctor who is helping one wean off. And then step by step, one is weaning off the narcotic over a 10-day to two-week period until finally the person with cancer has three full days in which no narcotic is taken, at which point it would be safe to begin the LDN. Okay. okay. Uh, we also recommend tramadol or Ultraset, uh, which is a semi-synthetic. And it seems like those folks are not having an issue at all either. The problem with it is that the um, relative potency is not as high. So you have to take more. Um, but be, it being a semi-synthetic and not um, binding at the same receptor sites, there might be some coverage there. That, the ultra-low dose um, is actually, the last time I heard about it is in clinical up in D.C. And they're getting some fairly positive results with that. But when you talk about that, you're talking about 0.1 milligram. 
Um, you know, and I'm not familiar with the pharmacology. It had very positive, what I, the last I read, okay, they had some very positive results with that. Pain relief. Pain relief as well as a reduction in uh, addiction, habituation too. I wouldn't think so. I wouldn't think so. I think that gentleman right there might be the one to ask him, but you're going to have to get in line after me because I got him next. <laughs> okay, so we recommend, uh, again, and it's historical, um, that the only drug that can be used is Copaxone. Uh, again, after the lecture, I might um, reconsider my opinion of that also. But it's interesting to note that all of these drugs that we recommend that people shouldn't take, they're taking anyway. Uh, 30 of them were taking Avonex, 28 were taking beta seron 58, which is here to date, we've been recommending that it would be okay to take uh, with your drug. We have 58 patients on it. Uh, Rebif 10, Tysabri 6. A little word aside, I would never take Tysabra in a million years. That's my opinion. Um, actually, my lawyer said I shouldn't say things like that because there might be somebody here. Um, I recommend that what you do is do a close study of Tessabra in the FDA and see that there weren't just two deaths. There were many, many more than two deaths on Tessabra. So somebody can experiment with somebody else other than our patients. Um, I don't know, and I have a feeling that these patients are not our patients because that's one of the questions that we ask. Are you on these other drugs? And we explain to them that we will not dispense to you. It's our decision to make. And I absolutely refuse to dispense anybody on Tysabra. And I really try to talk them out of using Tysabra. Okay. Okay, symptoms, again. We're very uh, pragmatic, uh, or I'm pragmatic now, I'm not a duck guy anymore. Um, we wanted to know, you know, what symptoms did you have before you started taking LDN? Okay, we want to make a comparison here. Is there some symptomatic relief? Even though, and, and I'll tell you, when you call me, I will say to you the indication for LDN is to prevent progressions. Uh, or, or slow down progressions or to prevent exacer exacerbations. That's the party line. That's what I tell people, okay? But we also want to know, because anecdotally, we hear a lot of this, you know, well, you know, my bowel and bladder is fine. I can walk. Um, I can, you know, I was able to get up. There's a famous uh, internet story where the guy, uh, took 1.5 milligrams of naltrexone one night, and the next night he got up, or the next day he got up, and he went out and cut his grass. Let me tell you about internet stories, okay? That guy is one of our patients. His father is a neurologist, uh, and he was sort of taking it on the sly. Um, he lives in, on Palm Beach, the island. Okay, any of you familiar with Palm Beach, the island in Florida? Palm Beach, the island in Florida is a very, very wealthy town. Okay, very, very wealthy place. He has a house on the ocean. Now, in front of his place is a beach. And on that beach, and I don't want to sound sexist, but I'm going to, are pretty girls in bikinis. Now, you think about it. You're a rich guy who's been in a wheelchair for two years, according to him. You're going to get up and cut the grass? I don't think so. I'm going to get up and I'm going to run after those girls in the bikinis, okay? I discount those sort of things because if a person has been in a wheelchair for two years and hasn't moved, I doubt very much he's going to get up and doing any running around at all. 